Broadcast. Yes, we're good. and uh, the Jew for All Network for inviting us for this uh, webinar. So the story is uh, to explain basically what we have been doing over the past 10 years in using open source geomatics and Phosphor-G to basically help us in what we do in rural areas in southern Tuscany. So uh, we will briefly... The outline of the presentation here is to briefly introduce the authors, then explain what we have been doing in, in life with Phosphor-G. Uh, what is actually the team behind uh, the authors? We're not alone doing this. Then I figure not most of you, or say maybe several of you might have been traveling to Italy as tourists, but the area where we are is not very well known. So it makes sense to explain actually the context where we are living. Uh, then we will scan, uh, kind of do a summary of projects in a nutshell, and then we will present three cases of what we have been doing, and then uh, understanding how this has been impacting our quality of life. Finally, some actions that we might do together or in parallel, we will see, and some conclusions. So, uh, as uh, myself, Andrea Giacomelli, I'm the guy here on, uh, on the right side of the picture. This picture was taken some time back in the Chicago Tourist Center, and we don't need now to go into the details of what we were doing there with two large gentlemen who are actually video game programmers playing cards, but that's me in the picture. And then the other authors on, uh, the, uh, on this presentation, which are Dario, Simone, Luigi, Rocha, and Tom and Pietro, please say hello. Hi, hi, hey, hello. hi, hi, hi. So these guys are, the guys that you should see, appear, see appearing in the next slide. So they're actually a rock band from Southern Tuscany called Etrusti from Lakota, hereafter EFL. And uh, they play music, but they also operate as citizen scientists. We have started to collaborate, intertwining what we do. And you will see more about this in a minute. So this is kind of the, the boring part. I put this all in, in one slide, but uh, uh, Geo for All said, please explain what you have been doing with Phosphor-G, and we don't need to go through every line item, but the idea is I started using open source software uh, during my master's uh, thesis in, back in 93, 94, my PhD, I contributed to shape laid by road extensions for ArcView, which were actually for opening up access to uh, ArcView projects, etc., etc. Uh, I was one of the founding members of the Italian chapter of OSGEO back in 2006 and 7. And there I was interested in uh, actually taking care of outreach and media relations. We thought, oh, if we need to explain what open source is about in geomatics, we need not just uh, developers, but also people doing this. And maybe this was you know, 10 years ago. Eventually, in 2010, I resigned from the GFOS ET, the, the OSGEO chapter, but we're still friends. And I started my own operations, both on the, on the NGO side and on the professional side. An interesting note was that in 2010, I submitted an abstract for the Phosphor G conference in South Africa, but it was rejected because it was considered too policy oriented. And so, well, whatever this means, I think there is a, a way of interacting between the policy oriented folks and the technologies, so this is why we're here. Another interesting uh, experience, I was the facilitator for one of the working groups for the European Inspired Directive on Spatial Data Infrastructures. So all these things sum up in the experiences that you will see explained uh, in, uh, in the coming slides. Uh, actually, about the relationship to Geo4All, 
uh, in fact, back in 2015, there was an invitation by some of the core team by geo for all to propose new organizations. And we actually proposed having our small NGO called activarti.org as a, as a point of contact. Uh, but if you see the wiki page, uh, we are kind of incubation phase, which is still happening. And we see if this can work in the future. This might be an interesting outcome of whatever collaborations may spawn for this event. So uh, about the people who are making these things happen. Back in 2008, we were two environmental engineers, which you see on the left myself and Francesco Di Bellini. Then there was Luca De Lucchi, who back then was a fresh master's in geography and now is working as a senior GIS researcher and is one of the pillars of the Open Street Map community in Italy, as well as for Force for D. Mm -hmm. Stefano Costa, who is a, an archaeologist back then doing his PhD. And we, we started explaining what we were doing. You see this flyer here is our, the first event we organized let me move, uh, okay. We, we organized this conference on how culture, environment, and open source informatics in general can integrate to help the development of territories, in principle, our land. And this was back in June 2008. Time goes by, and we're now in 2017. So we have actually a small network of professionals, of associations, of research, organizations, and we have communities, people. So you see here some of them portrayed in various moments of life and activities we do together. Uh, there is not enough space to put them all, but if you go to the sites uh, pibinco.org or attivarti.org, you will get references about who these people are. We also sometimes negative assumptions help because we do stuff which sometimes appears convoluted to some people. So it helps to say what we are not. We are not academics. I have a PhD, but I never went for an academic career. Uh, we are environmental engineers, but we are not environmentalists in the sense of being aggressive environmental folks. We are not avant-garde people, but sometimes they say so or we're not strange, no. We just, uh, we, in spite of this, we have a research and a publication track record. We have our ideas on how to behave with environmental policies. We do innovative stuff and so forth. What we try to accomplish by being together is we try to summarize this in three lines as a promotion and protection of lesser known assets in the areas of culture, environment, and open innovation, which in Italian is cultura, ambiente, innovazione libera. So, and we do this with research, not just scientific research. Sometimes we do exploration. We do innovation, or sometimes we find out old practices that are new because people forgot about them. And we communicate and engage a lot of people about this. Uh, then this sort of creates the bridge for our Etruski <laughs> from Lakota. Uh, since the beginning, we started embedding, you know, multimedia, photography, videos, uh, radio shows, which we contributed to create, to do open street art campaigns in Milano. We ended up writing songs about neo-geography. You know, it's kind of experimenting how to relay things in a different way. And more recently, uh, I met these guys in 2015. And uh, we started actually mingling the music they do with the things we do on, on the communication side. And so this is again explained in, uh, on the pibinco.org site, but this gives you some snapshots. Uh, uh, for some reason, you know, people like things. I, I like a lot of music, so whatever we do has a soundtrack. Uh, especially in the past 15 years, I started to use this to kind of you know, reinforce some of the things that we are explaining. And uh, these are different cases. In the top left, you see this is the band in the small village where uh, we are based. This is actually a poet and a shepherd who then collaborates with us on some presentations. Or interestingly, the bottom picture is from July 2005. And this is the Hungry March Band from Brooklyn. And, uh, and they were in Sardinia for a kind of Italian tour. So, and we, we got in contact. 
So by putting, no, by keeping on doing things with the music, uh, sometimes you find people that talk about the things that you do for your work. So I do geographic information systems applied to rural development, environment, and land planning. And I found a trusty from La Cota who talk about land planning and rural things in their songs. So this is to give you an idea, like one song can become a, a socioeconomic analysis of a rural area, and I give it to them. <laughs> Il contadino magro sta osservando il cielo. Il cielo sull'acqua sporca sul contadino magro. Ama la terra più di qualsiasi donna. Legge il suo gallo come fosse un Sicuro con un cane da guardia la notte. Resta i parenti che festeggiano già la sua morte. Il contadino si alza dal letto di scatto. happening. So sometimes you find it's uh, uh, useful to bring to people like, you know, a analytical, technological point of view to an issue, show them the maps, show them uh, the charts. Sometimes explaining the story helps people understand an issue. Now, having understood more or less who we are, what we do, and what soundtrack we like to use, I'd like to explain where we actually are. And, uh, so let's say, I assume that everybody knows more or less where is Italy in the globe, so we are there. And uh, Italy is at the center of the Mediterranean, so this is more or less, again, what you see often in the news. Uh, 
where we are in Italy, we're in the central Italy. We're to give you a bearing to the towns you may be familiar with. We are about two and a half, three hours north of Rome drive, or two hours south of Florence. So in, in the larger map, you see Florence here. Uh, Rome is actually the, the red patch in the lower part of the picture. And the, the area where we are is a very rural area in the hills. And I put here some names. So basically, I'm based in Tornella Piloni. The other guys are from Monte Castelli, Castelnova, Di Cecina, who send the references. The point is, this is rural. Uh, to, to explain this, you see this is the, in Europe, we have the European level land cover map called Corin, which is updated every five, six years. I don't remember now. And uh, basically, the green and yellow areas is all basically agricultural, mountain, forest, and so forth. The urban or industrial areas are the red areas, you can see. So basically, where we are, we don't have a lot of cities around us. The other point is we have very small municipalities and small villages, but I will say a little more about, more about that in a minute. To give you another another way, kind of a proxy to understand that we are in a rural area, uh, I took the census data from East at the National Statistics Institute in Italy, and I mapped the number taking the tourism section of the census. I mapped the number of farmhouses that are existing by municipality, you know, so where you can go as a tourist to sleep and enjoy farming activities if you like the idea. So what you see here, we don't need a zoom, but uh, the, the red area and, and the kind of red-orange area is where the highest number of farmhouses per municipality is located. And basically, this is all of Tuscany and Umbria, which is the bordering region. So this gives you a feeling that we are in an area with lots of farms and potentially lots of tourism. Now. A little more ideas on what is a rural area. I assume also several of you might be actually coming from a rural region or have relations there, so that wouldn't be strange. Uh, but when I talk about rural in, in the part of the map I showed you, we have villages and hamlets with a population typically below 1,000, maybe even less, maybe below 100, you know, 40 residents, 50 residents. The other point is these places are being emptied. So in the 60s after World War II, so economy was flourishing, everybody was happy, and the baby boom was there. Population back then was like five times higher than what we have now. So there are not many people are there, but a lot less. There are lots of empty houses, lots of empty bars, and so forth. This doesn't mean these are gloomy places. <laughs> Please note. The other point is things are spread apart. Basically, nothing is less than 30 minutes drive from something else. It's like, want to have a beer, go 30 minutes. Want to see a movie, drive 40 minutes. And you forgot your cigarettes, drive 20 minutes. Uh, the point is, this is not much different than commuting time or in a city. The point is the distance you're traveling. So your, your cinema will be you know, 30 miles away, and your uh, uncle will be 50 miles away. But that's part of your daily routine to visit them. The other point is that we are in the hills. Things happen generally around 400 meters above sea level. And the point is that uh, September through March, uh, so the, the autumn, winter, starting spring is very slow. April to August, we get tourists on the coast in Florence, in Pisa, in Siena, you name it. And some of them eventually flow into our surroundings. But otherwise, things can be slow, which again doesn't mean this is a bad thing. Our main uh, location from where the projects you will see have uh, developed is uh, called Torniella. I actually forgot to put the name in the slide, but anyway. And uh, this is the village you see in the picture here. It's in the valley. It's uh, in the middle of the woods. And uh, the, the pictures below show more or less where this is located. So this is about one hour south of Siena, for those of you who were in Tuscany, or as I said, two hours south of Rome. To give you a measure of the, no, what is the environment, the three villages which are in the valley have about 400 residents to date, and they are clearly concentrated in the villages. Out of that, the valley is like 120 square kilometers with 400 people. There are probably more, a lot more wild boars or foxes or any porcupines uh, 
you name whatever species in the valley than people. Then Etruski from Lepota, in the, they are from this area which is about one hour distance. We said everything is at least half an hour distance from anything else, so they're not far. And uh, they're actually reference villages called Monte Castelli Pisano. I put a blue arrow here because the picture is, I could not zoom this. Uh, again, this is about 80 kilometers southwest from Florence. Interestingly, people think of Tuscany as a nice agricultural place, which it is, but it used to be historically also one of the largest mining districts in Italy, and uh, where they live is actually one of the largest geothermal reservoirs in Italy and, and Europe. So, things happen. Now, uh, a way of getting into the projects we find later is also remind you some of the key concepts about our region. In Italy, I, I travel a lot for business, for just for business because I don't do much leisure travel. Uh, lots of, when you mention Italy is associated to beauty. Historically, you know, the Germans and the British were coming to Italy in the 19th century because it was beautiful and so forth. Then you had the award, uh, Academy Award, you know, the, the great beauty movie by Paolo Sorrentino a couple of years ago. So this was beautiful, and Tuscany is beautiful. You see, this is a screenshot, one of the official, uh, the official tourism portal for Tuscany. Beautiful places, the hills with the cypress, and the villas, and, and the sunflowers. This is a picture I actually took back in 2006 uh, with this dancer on a pool with the hills. So everything is beautiful. But <laughs> at the same time, you might get cases like what you see here. This is my house in Tati which uh, during the spring, but the photo is not in the spring, but then in the winter you can get snow like this, covering the door. So it could be the great beauty or no country for old men. And this is reiterated by the fact that uh, while Italy, again, is a powerful country, we are in the G8 group of uh, uh, strongest economies, Tuscany is beautiful, the food is great, the landscape is breathtaking, etc. But in the southern part of the region, be aware that you might get like you know 30 hour power outages or you might get patchy mobile coverage so you can't do conference calls or uh, yes we are on the sea we are in the mediterranean area but nature as i'm saying you know not the journal but the real nature will challenge you with wolves with uh, wildlife in the middle of things this is actually a, a landslide which took down a part of a road very close to where it was yeah, it's, on, it's on the path I need to drive through to come to visit them. And situations like this are not uncommon in, in the inter, inner parts of Tuscany and other uh, areas of hills and mountains. You may know that Italy is one of the countries with the highest hydrologic risk for landslides and similar cases. So uh, now in the last couple of years, there has been a lot of talk and it would be growing, for example, on the sustainable development goals which have been identified by the United Nations. And I would be interested about computing the indicators for our area because I'm quite sure that, yes, we are in a nice place to be. But some indicators, I would figure, would be a lot lower than the average of Italy or other European countries. So this gives you an idea of the context of where we are. And now I would... Uh, with a very brief interaction. Okay. So actually, the first project which triggers the collaborations that we have is uh, please bear with some mild off-topic components of the presentation, but they're not because we also used phosphor G to do this. And I don't need to go through this, but it was basically related to culture. We brought an ancient game to Chicago, Illinois, in the summer calendar of uh, 2007 for the Department of Culture in the city of Chicago. This happened, and it basically helped us to create the core of our working group. Having done this, and I, I won't go through the details, but the idea is that uh, whatever we've been doing over the past 10 years, at least once we have, like, at least national visibility. So maybe we do sometimes complex stuff, but for some reason it's interesting and attractive to people. 
to give you a, a summary of places we have been for projects in the past 10 years, this gives you a, a map that uh, you can picture our range of places. Uh, we were a couple of times in the States, a lot, of course, in Europe. Beijing was actually a post that we said we couldn't go there for budget reasons, but still in a presentation made by a colleague. And then you can see that in Europe, we have been traveling around, and in Italy, we tend to be based in Tuscany for what we do, but we like the idea of showcasing things around and collaborating with people from other areas. Research aspects, I, again, I won't go through the abbreviations, but this is just to give you kind of a glimpse of institutions and abbreviations of uh, department and research institutes, uh, in both in Italy and, uh, and Europe. And I'm putting this because sometimes people just see the outreach side and they don't see that this also has peer-reviewed uh, work going on in, in the background and so forth. Then we, we are involved in training and tutoring activities. For example, in 2012, we were working with the high schools in the Leghorn area in Tuscany. We, we had the MOUs with the University for Translations. And just at the, at the end of April, we will be starting some student internships for high school students to work with us for about a month. What we do goes, as I said, in the national media occasionally, but quite frequently. And uh, I won't go through the, I mean, the list. Maybe what's interesting, one of our projects was, was in the Italian version of the Mickey Mouse magazine with a special insect. And for those in the States, uh, this uh, whole ancient game thing ended up on Comcast Sports News, as you can see from the screenshot on the lower right. Uh, what we do occasionally gets awards. So we, in 2009, 15, 17, we have been getting recognition for what we do outside of the actual work we do. Uh, related to biodiversity festival, to other things. Uh, and then, okay, so in a way, it works. Concerning interactions with the research community outside of research projects, and we are occasionally invited to give lectures in university. The first four, I, I don't remember the actual year, but they were before 2004. Otherwise, we have been invited by the Joint Research Center of the European Commission to participate to a workshop on a position paper on the Digital Earth Initiatives, uh, another workshop with, with JRC and NASA in 2011 on socioeconomic benefits of Earth observation and similar things. Uh, I need to talk about software at some point, otherwise this won't be a phosphor G webinar. Uh, this is, I mean, we, we have a very basic technology stack in the end. We have a virtual server, a couple of PCs, and we use basic stuff. You know, I used to be a developer in the late 90s. Now I like younger developers to do the development work, and uh, everybody has a role in what we do. But basically, we use whatever we can of, of open source. There may be exceptions, maybe you know, for hardware connectivity of sensors or things that we might want to improve. But in general, we're a, a free open source shop for software. What we do has a economic impact in itself. You know, we're not a tourist promotion agency, but people will travel to see places where we do our work. We're not a research institution, but researchers will come to do research where we your things and so forth. Again, I don't want to go through the details now. I, I'm trying to summarize the numbers you see here are people per night, you know, like staying over. And this is important because, as I was saying, the areas where we are uh, tend to be not visited by anybody. And so the fact of bringing people there is actually helping the local economy and uh, improving the quality of, let's say, not decreasing the quality of our lives. To make a long story short, uh, the idea is that we have 10 years of activity with things happening with at least national visibility, and this has an international con um, contact, and okay, it, it's working more or less. Let's switch to the next section. <laughs> Uh, so, 
here we have some projects I, you know, you, you can go on the website of forpbinfo.org, we have a list, full list of projects also interact with other organizations. But here I wanted to mention four. One very briefly was really at the beginning and then the others are basically running to date. So the first one, which was the really born inside the, you know, Post4G community in Italy was this, uh, it, it was supposed to be a, a mapping party for Milano launched by the OpenStreetMap community, which back then was extremely uh, low numbers in Italy, like maybe 40 people nationwide and four people in the city of Milano, which is 1.1 million. Uh, so in order to kind of foster some critical mass, basically I suggested to the OpenStreetMap guys to join partnership with the local radio station and we had this kind of mix with a mapping campaign and a communication campaign for which we actually created a new name which was Mappare Milano. We were kind of exposing the idea of mapping but actually having people go around and think about what they were finding in their surroundings. And again, back then this was quite innovative in combining a technological approach which was typical of the OpenStreetMap community and the communication and engagement side, which we did and ended up with a workshop in Politecnico di Milano, so it was nice. And this really laid the grounds for the other projects. This is what we're doing 10 years after that. So we're in the Pharma Valley where we're staying, and uh, this is a picture of in the Pharma Creek, one of the areas with these nice rocks and ponds and things you can bathe in eventually. The idea is that we created a community map which basically filled in what currently is a gap in the official geographic information which is being made available. So what you see here is a map of Tuscany with the network of um, uh, hiking trails for the region. And uh, to the right you see, zoom in is the hiking trails for where we are in the Pharma Valley. You see there are basically one trail. So it's kind of, I guess it's limited if you like hiking. It's maybe more than you want if you don't like hiking, but this is what it is. So, uh, what we did, and in any case, let's say this does not portray what is the actual level of knowledge that the locals have about the area. So if you take, for example, Paola from Piloni, which is a farmer, a hunter, she runs her farmhouse and actually does very good cooking, as you can see from this picture, uh, preparing tortelli. Uh, we gave her a base map and she drew her own trails on the map, so it's kind of exposing different activities that a tourist or a researcher may want to use in their, in their projects or activities. Uh, so to, to, to give us like an objective for accomplishing the target, in 2015 we applied for this Involen competition. Involen was a European research funded project on environmental education and it was asking communities uh, or schools like, you know, to, to engage with uh, elders from their community and identify information that could then go in a location-based game. And we eventually developed two games. They're kind of an alpha version, very raw, but the idea was really to document the process and the concept rather than developing a full uh, app. And you can find them on this attivati.org uh, Valle del Farma site they're actually also in English, so it's a bilingual site like most of the sites we use. Now, starting from there, and you can see again highlights of the making of the Parma Valley games, uh, and again for some reason it's combining the maps that you see in the middle with interviews with people playing guitar once again, and uh, or things like this, but anyway, the, this activity led us to something that I, I will just show you, show you some uh, clips from the, the, the data set we created. So this is the official base map from the Regione Toscana, the regional government, the 1 to 10,000 map. And what we created by interviewing the locals was a map like this. So all, all the dots you see here are place names which are not in the official map. And they're portraying elements which are maybe uh, water springs. Here we have a lot of uh, chestnut uh, trees and actually here before, before wheat, people used to eat chestnuts back you know, 100 years ago. 
and so you have all the facilities which are used for to dry the chestnuts and, or to make coal and more and more things. To give you a full picture on the valley, this is a very raw, actually you don't see the valley here, you see a part of the, of the creek, but anyway, again, what we, to give you an idea of the coverage we have, is something like this, and we're actually still completing this for part of the valley. The idea is that this way, and uh, the data set that we are generating is published on the official uh, open data portal for Region of Toscana, so we have a data product which is generated from completely bottom-up and is talking to the other layers of open data which is available in our region. It's that uh, we give in the Phosphor-G community, we like the idea of giving back, so the map eventually went back to, to the community. What, what you see here are the, the maps. We printed some copies. We had some meeting to, to share the map and proceed with the work. switching from one, one project to the other. This is completely different and I'm taking a, I guess related, and I'm taking a sort of a global angle to introduce it. So what you see here is a mosaic put in a great on, on a globe of this Suomi NPP mission from NASA showing basically night lights. And if you approach uh, planet Earth on the Italian side, you see lots of lights here. You see Italy, you see Northern Europe, you see the Balkan area and so forth. And uh, you tend to see that we have a lot of lights in Italy compared to other, uh, let's quote, developed countries uh, in, according to official rankings. Now, uh, to see where this brings us, the, the idea is that uh, uh, artificial light that we use basically to provide safety, to help us do things at night, to drive and park. We tend to use a lot of it because we kind of lost the idea of the effort required to keep a light on and it's conveniently available. Uh, and uh, what we forget in doing this is that uh, the excess of artificial light eventually, like many types of excess, has a negative uh, <coughs> impact. For example, Light pollution can have an impact on ecology, on landscape, on astronomy, on for amateur astronomers, they need to move somewhere else compared to their typical sites for observations. And it will have also an effect on human health and uh, energy consumption. So this is, we don't want to go into the details now, but the idea is that currently we have pictures like this. The first global atlas of light pollution was created in 2001 by Cinzano et Ali. And this gives you an idea which relates to the fact that we are familiar with that more lights are where more people are and more people with a, let's say, good quality of life or high quality of life, and they can afford lighting, basically. And this map was eventually updated with a new publication from last year by Falki and others, which are the former collaborators of Shinsan. So if we zoom the new map on Europe, this is a picture that you get. and. You can understand that the white, red, orange areas are the more urban areas, industrial settlements, and so forth. The scale goes down to yellow, green, blue, and if you go in the middle of the desert, or in Namibia, for example, this is not in this area, but, or if you go in the middle of the sea, you will get a black uh, scale indicating absence of light pollution and a, basically a natural sky. Interestingly, a natural sky is not dark because you get the brightness from the stars and so anyway. So if we bring this to Italy, we are saying we are a very, very polluted uh, country from the standpoint of light pollution, let's say, or likely that we need improvement. But we also see that uh, the area where we are based here in southern Tuscany, it's not blue, but it's, most of it is green. And this is together with other areas in the island of Sardinia and in southern Italy. This, this is the region called Basilicata and Calabria. So you see that one difference, which is of interest for us, is that the, uh, the 
area in Tuscany is in the hills. The other areas are kind of extreme mountain areas, you know, over 1,000 meters, and you need to get there. Tuscany has whatever Tuscany has, which is nice, plus this uh, peculiarity, which not many people know about. And this is a zoom on Tuscany, so you, basically we are located in the northern part of the circle here in the green area. Uh, to give you an actual snapshot of the sky that we can get here, this is the castle of Montemassi. And this is a picture taken by photographer called Federico Giussani. So you can see the Milky Way, of course, there will be light pollution from the cities on the plain, but still you have a pretty good sky quality in an area which is uh, fairly accessible. Interestingly, this castle is, is portrayed in a painting from the 14th century. So we have uh, say the privilege of living in places that are portrayed in paintings from the Middle Age. But, uh, then we have other issues on the other hand. So, to do something about this, we started this citizen uh, science camp campaign back in 2008 called Buiometria Participativa. We're basically lending sensors. We have a few, we're a small group, but we have a good network to lend them. And these sensors go around Italy and people will take measures so they will eventually understand the issue of light pollution and actual, take actual measurements. Uh, this brought us uh, to significant national visibility and eventually the, over the past four years we were also representing Italy in a European network called Ross of the Night for re interdisciplinary research on artificial light at night with other about 40 organizations from research uh, and uh, park managers and so forth to deal with different aspects of lighting in cities and in natural areas. The other uh, operation we started, uh, in addition to the handheld citizen science measurements, was in 2011 actually starting a fixed station monitoring network. And here you see called Cobbilit. And this is again working and it's using all our open source stack to harvest data and do simple reporting and so forth. With all this, the point we, we were saying that, you know, the projects we're doing are these making us happy. How is our quality of life? And please consider that I mean, until 2010, I was actually working as a senior GIS analyst in a multinational uh, corporation. I was living in Milano, so a big city for Italy. And uh, what could I say? You know, in 10 years or so, I did not lose weight, so I would say I have food, I have basic things that I need for my life. But I'm telling more jokes than 10 years ago. So I would say I'm happier, because if you're not happy, you won't be telling jokes to friends. These are very raw indicators, I don't know. Then, most of the people in the network I presented have a freelance status, so this has pros and has lots of cons. So this is something we might want to improve. And as I mentioned, we have real demography issues because, as I said, the places where we are based, population used to be a lot more. So this means that the local governments or the national governments will tend to have less attention for these areas because you know, somebody says that 80% you know, of the population is going to the cities, so let's do the smart city projects, and 80% of the population will go to the coasts. And so let's do projects for the coast. And we're not a coast and we're not a, a city. So what happens next? Uh, just as we're approaching the conclusion, I wanted to get back on the software side of things. You know, When I was starting my work as a GIS researcher, I was working then in a science and technology park in Sardinia, the island. The, and uh, at the time, lots of sales folks were saying, Oh, at some point, because GIS is complicated, GIS is really big screens, uh, and everybody was saying, oh, don't worry, GIS will become a commodity. People will just use it. They don't even remember what that they're using. This is partly been happening with the you whole know, digital globes and uh, that we know about, and other facilities and GPS and so forth. Uh, and I remember that I took this from a very old presentation, like 2000, the very old, relative. Anyway, this is from the late 90s, the, you know, we had this like, oh, what is a system and a geographic information system to have data tools, people, and sometimes we were mentioning processes to introduce what we are handling. And uh, if I'm considering things as we see them in, in our experience, 
uh, it's true that for us, basically, phosphor G technologies are a commodity. We use them as needed. We, we don't uh, we don't have to invest in understanding what we need to use. And uh, what what is interesting for me is that free and open source software is there. OSGEO is there. Uh, we know where to find things. Open data is there. But it's raw data now, people are advocating, let's say it's there. Interoperability has developed, etc., etc. Uh, my impression is sometimes that at this point the limiting factor will be the the openness of, of will be the openness of the people who are involved in the data to those people. So in, in the things I'm doing working as a liaison between a global and a local level, I think it's interesting to assess these points and ideally share them with you. The, uh, what we can do at the point of all this is uh, basically we're here, so we have our track record. If you need uh, you know, what we find on our websites in terms of services, we're here. Actually, come and visit us if you want to do work on biodiversity, on rural things, on light pollution, on noise pollution. We have a good baseline environment. You can actually code with or for us. We basically don't have any developers. so. Whenever I go to a phosphor conference, I keep scouting for developers. You might want to have proposed visitors to come here. Of course, you can donate to the NGO part of what we do. We have a mailing list. And uh, as far as what we are doing, you know, we more or less have an idea. We plan and have things for the yearly planning and more. But if you have suggestions based on what you have seen, we will be glad to hear them. What, what next? So what, what's happening in the very next days, weeks? We're planning to have the fourth time of the spring school in, in end of April. Then uh, during the summer, we'll have a summer calendar of events, but I will relay details later. And then we will, just as we did at the end of December, a winter festival combining the music, the open source mapping, and all the rest, which was a first edition back in mid-December. We're planning on version number two. So to wrap up, I will give it just again for the Etruski to close, and then I will, we are done. <laughs>